house of our God today. Well, there's some Sundays I wonder if the worship team is saved. But that ain't today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Same sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. Fire baptized. Devil stomping. Squir- scripture quoting. Bible toting. Don't make me get country. Y'all just <laughs> so glad. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. This is where we're going to be today. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're glad to see him in the house of the Lord. Look back at that neighbor and say, you really need a mint. (laughs) Amen. Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. We are in this series. It is our assignment. It is our mandate for 2024. That this is the year, according to the Hebraic calendar, 5784, 2024. That this is the year of effective doors that are being opened at the word of the Lord. And for over eight weeks now, nine weeks, we have been preaching on effective doors, effective doors. And. Most of us are so focused on the next door that we don't really pay attention to what he's doing in the moment right now. And for the next few minutes, I want to speak to you, preach to you, challenge you in an area that um, <clears throat> that there are a lot of denominational distinctions with. I, I want to challenge you, uh, full transparency, when, I, when the Lord gave me this sermon in this particular series back in September of last year. I really thought it was going to go one direction, and when I was finishing my time Friday, buttoning up this message, the Lord just kind of veered it into a a, a very interesting direction, and we're just going to follow him, amen? Amen. Amen. I've subtitled this message this morning, Shut That Door. Shut That Door. I have found that um, most people find it really hard that, that... it's hard to trust God, it's hard to walk God, walk with God and, and, and walk with the Lord in those seasons when um, the door that you think should be opened is not opened. It, it feels bad <clears throat> when you come to a door that you think is for you and then all of a sudden that door doesn't open for you and the pain, the rejection, the, the, lack, of, um, the lack of opportunity, it, it hurts full transparency, when you think, man, God is about to do it in this moment, in this way, just like this, and you were trying to walk through, and you get to that door only to be rejected or denied access. What, what's worse than doors that don't open is do- doors that do open that you're not ready for. Come on. Come on. It, it's one thing to have an unopened door. It's another thing to have an open door, and you're just not prepared, and And I've learned that you don't have to get ready for an open door if you stay ready for the open door. And today, the the focus of this message is one of the ways that you can stay ready for the open door is to make sure that there is one door that stays closed. According to Scripture, there is a door that must remain closed if you are going to be ready for the open doors that he's about to swing wide. We find it in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is speaking. He says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Those were were, um, players, actors of the day. Hypocrisy is not people who act one way and are really another way. Hypocrisy is when you put on the mask and pretend for the sake of the audience. Another sermon, another day. Watch this. For the hypocrites, for the hypocrites, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets and that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, Jesus is saying, I say to you, you have your reward. Verse 6, but when you pray, just in case you're wondering if he's talking to you, but you, when you pray, He didn't say every day when you pray. He said that if you're going to pray, many of us, the the potency of our prayer life doesn't exist because our prayer life doesn't exist. And so he's not putting a religious rule to you that you need to pray every single day. And if you don't, you're going to bust hell wide open. What he's saying is that in those moments when you do actually come to me and talk to me in prayer, 
Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret re will reward you openly. And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathens do. Now, he didn't address hypocrites, and now he's talking about heathens. Heathens pray the same thing all the time for the sake of praying. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him. Okay? When you do these vain repetitions like the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask. What Jesus is showing you and me is he's showing us a picture of what our personal prayer life should be like. And Jesus is challenging you and I to shut the prayer door and lock ourselves away with just him. Listen, personal prayer, communication, communion with God in the area of communication with prayer is one of the most spiritual things you and I can do as a believer. This is not about religious duty, and this is, not a, this is about personal encounters. The most spiritual thing, one of the most spiritual things you can do is actually pray and have a conversation with God. Listen, he, he was telling them that if all you're going to pray for is for show, then that's all the rewards you're going to get. People are going to be really impressed with you, but life is really not going to change. You may be able to pray, and I'm talking about King James prayers, y'all. That thou wouldest cometh to me, that thou shalt showeth me the greatest and mightiest things that thou hast done it. You say enough ifs and attacks. When you do all of that good religious stuff, there may be people in the room that are impressed with you, but that doesn't mean God is. I, I was taught at a very early age, um, if you're going to worry about it, don't pray about it. But if you're going to pray about it, then don't worry about it. He says in verse 6 that when you go into your room, the prayer room, your war room, your prayer closet, whatever you want to call it, I, he says go in there and shut the door because I don't want people to see how spiritual you are. And, and many people limit it to just like, okay, so when I pray I shouldn't really be out front and there are people, that, all that kind of stuff. And be there. That's not what he's communicating. Watch this. The, the reality is much, goes much deeper than just being seen praying. There are conversations that God wants to have with you that nobody else should be able to eavesdrop on. And here's the challenge in 2024. Help me, Holy Spirit. We talk to too many people about our issues. We pray about it and get counseling. We pray about it and go to our friends. We pray about it and get mentors' opinions. We pray about it and read books about it. We get podcasts about it. We talk to our parents about it. We go to YouTube for it. We do research on TikTok about it. Come on. And what happens is you can pray about it and hear from the Lord, and then you get all of these other things. And I'm not, I'm not anti-getting guidance. I'm not anti-getting counsel. But most often, we don't know come here from Sikkim because we're so confused by everybody else's opinion about what's going on in our life. But they don't know the plans that they have for me. Only he knows the plans they have for me. And here's what I've learned, ladies and gentlemen, in 48 years of living. If it took God to tell me what to do, how am I going to accept this plan? Expect them to understand what I should be doing. Okay. Because watch this. There are some conversations that only should stay between me and God. Uh, let, let me give it to you another way. Everything that God speaks is not for social media. Let me talk to my people that do this, everything that he speaks is not for sermon material. 
There are some conversations that he and I have that is nobody else's business. Watch this, including my wife. You see, you see we, we don't get this in, in our world because we feel like we need to tell everybody. And then we need everybody to tell us. And here's the truth, because what we're really doing is either intentionally or unintentionally, we're trying to find somebody who agrees with our opinion so that it gives us some kind of permission to go do what we really want to do. But the truth of the matter is, there are some conversations that should never leak out of my prayer time. The, uh, where's Trey? Somebody grab Trey for me. Um, the, the old church had this. I'm about, to, I'm about to get old school, okay? Y'all calm down. It, the old church had this. They, they had the understanding that that there were some things that was only there between them and Jesus. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Does, it, does anybody, like, like there's some conversations that God is having with me and I'm having with God that if it ever got, got out, man, I'm not prepared. Hey, um, put me in E flat, will you? That I'm not prepared for it. Because we didn't have the whole conversation after one time we talked about it. There are some things that, that we've been talking about for years. And, and it's not because they're sin issues. It, it's, it's because I'm being transformed. Because he's renewing my mind. And so there are things that are happening that he was talking to me about in my teenage years that here I am in my 40s starting to really understand. Because we've been having this conversation for decades. E flat, e flat. The old church, the, the old church, all right, y'all calm down now. You're going to take me somewhere I ain't going to be able to get out of it. The old church, it was so important for their private prayer life that it spilled out even in worship songs for them. They, they would sing songs like, I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. For I cannot bear these burdens alone. I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus Here's why Jesus can help me I hear you boy Jesus alone that, that was songs they would sing That they were white But it worked. Because Jesus is just all white with me. Do you understand? That's so stupid. Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. That's what he would say. Oh, perfect. Then they would say something like, leave them there. Leave it there. Take your burdens to the Lord. Watch this. And leave them there. This is why we carry burdens. Because we're taking them to our parents, we're taking them to our friends, we're taking them to our pastor, we're taking them to our counselor, we're taking them to the podcast, we're taking them to our books. No, if I'll trust and never doubt, he will surely bring me out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them. 
burdens because we're having conversations to people who can't do nothing about it. And there are some of us that we go into our prayer room, we give it to God, watch this, and he cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. But somehow we learn how to get qualified in scuba diving <laughs> and bring those things back up again. He says when you go in, <laughs> I love this church. When you go back in, shut the door behind you because I don't want you to be confused about what's happening. Here's what I've learned, ladies and gentlemen. Public rewards are the result of personal encounters. Public rewards are the result of personal encounters. And if you see people, that you see the hand of God sitting on them, blessing after blessing after blessing, most often is because there are conversations that are going on privately time after time after time again. He says when you go into your room, shut the door and pray. Shut the door and pray. Watch this. To the God who is in the secret place. He describes the place of personal communion prayer and encounter as a secret place. Watch this. Not because it's hard to find, but because there's conversations that are to remain private. And I came to tell somebody this morning that's looking for answers. Answers are waiting in the secret place. In your personal encounter, your personal prayer time with the Lord. Now, 
Jesus, this is where the sermon turned a little bit for me. Jesus is having this conversation pre-ascension. He says, it's, it's expedient, it's imperative that I go away because if I do not go, I cannot release the comforter. The alos parakletos in the Greek, it means someone just like me. He's not going to be the Jesus with you, the Emmanuel, the God that is with you. He's going to become the Holy Spirit that is in you. He's having this conversation about going into a personal prayer time with the Lord. And the thing that you and I have access to is not praying to God, but also allowing God to pray through us to himself, called the Holy Spirit. When you get into that prayer closet, when you pray, pray until the Spirit takes over. Well, Pastor, uh, here we go. What, why? Listen to Jude chapter 1, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, King James, the Holy Ghost, Keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He's telling you that if you're going to build you, it requires prayer. For the building of me, it requires a personal encounter, a personal communion, a personal prayer life with God. Look at this text. He says, I want you to build yourself up in your most holy faith. The implication here is that there is a faith. And then there is a holy faith, and then there's the most holy faith. And the only way to build the most holy portion of you is to be praying in the Holy Spirit. I love this text in Jude 20 and 21 because it implies this, look at this, that the mercy of God will sustain you, that the love of God will keep you, but praying in the Spirit of God will build you. The mercy of God will sustain you. Anybody thankful for mercy? Anybody counting on mercy? Anybody believing for mercy? The mercy of God is what sustains us, but it is the love of God that keeps us. The reason why I've been kept in my teens and in my 20s and in my 30s and now here in my late 40s, it wasn't by me, it wasn't by charisma, it wasn't because I earned it, it wasn't because I was religious, it was the love of God. It was the everlasting love of God, the unconditional agape love of God that has kept me all this time. While the mercy sustains me and his love keeps me, it is the praying of the Spirit that builds me. And to build your most holy faith requires the Spirit to pray. And I know this is a concept that is different for some of us from our backgrounds. But this is a moment, this is a time, this is a tool, this is a gift that God allows you and me to have that builds me. I don't know if you've ever gone through this. Y'all, good God, can I be Glenn for a minute? Two and a half years of fighting hell with this city to start this building project. And now three and a half million dollars into this process. There, three, two Sundays, three Sundays ago now, almost collapsed in the second service from sheer exhaustion. It wasn't me going on a sabbatical. It wasn't just me um, drinking more water. It wasn't just me. I had to get in my face and I had to get on the prayer closet and I had to pray until the Holy Ghost began to pray with me and strength began to come back into my life. My tank began to be filled. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's something powerful when I take my mind out of it and just let the Holy Spirit intercede on my behalf. Why? Because the Bible says that the Spirit prays according to the will of the Father. When I don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what to say. No, some of you, yeah, you did good just to come to a non-Baptist church. First Corinthians chapter 14, so powerful. Look at this. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and, and just so we're clear, before you start debating me theologically, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth to set order in the church meeting. Because they were so busy praying in tongues that the non-believers never heard anything. So he said, I'd rather you prophesy so that they have an understanding. But don't forbid the speaking of tongues. 
Because there's something powerful that happens. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, these signs follow them that believe. That praying in tongues is a sign to the unbeliever that there's supernatural things manifesting. Look at this text in 1 Corinthians 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. There are some conversations that need to be had between you and God that you can't be in the middle of. Because we pray selfishly. And we pray soulishly. I don't need my soul to pray all the time because my soul has self attached to it. It is directly, watch this, my soul is directly connected with my flesh and my spirit. And there are sometimes I am more carnal than I am spiritual. That's why I ask God to kill somebody when they merge into traffic wrong on 77 South in rush hour. So there are moments when the spirit has to take over because I can allow my soul to attach myself to my flesh. And the Lord says, I need all of you out of the way by being yielded to me completely. Okay. He, he's telling us, he's writing to the church at Corinth. I need your mind, your understanding to be unfruitful because when you pray in your native language, you know what you're saying. So then you start thinking about what you're saying. And there's times when you need to pray. And you don't need to be lazy, <laughs> lazy Pentecostal people who only want the Holy Ghost to do all the talking. Paul said, no, balance is you pray with your understanding, but then there is a spirit language. So that your mind has nothing to do with the conversation because the Spirit knows the will of the Father and it's in communion. And while that communion is manifesting, my most holy faith is being built. Have you ever been in a scenario where people around you are speaking a language you don't understand? We're, we're kingdom-minded people. We, we go out of the country all the time because Jesus is bigger than America. Okay. He's bigger than Republicans. He's bigger than Democrats. He's bigger than the White House. So it's great to get around the world because that's God is doing things all around the world. And it, the hindrance for me, though, is when they're having a conversation and I'm standing, I don't have a clue what's being said. So I have to rely on an interpreter to hopefully tell the truth. I just imagine there's times we've been in Honduras, Ecuador, Panama, and I'm preaching the gospel, and there's moments I wonder because the congregation laughs, but I didn't tell a joke. <laughs> and I'm thinking, my interpreter just said, this gringo don't have a clue what he's talking about right now. It, it, it's scenarios like that where you feel out of the loop. Out of the loop, and... There's feelings of confusion and insecurity and helplessness and awkwardness and ignorance and, and dependency abounds. And I don't know how you are, but when I walk away from moments like that, I think to myself, man, if I could just speak that language, then I could be in the moment and I could avoid all those things and all those actions that are being said. I, I don't know how it is, but I would assume going to a nail salon Because I'm a dude, I don't do manicures and pedicures. Because I'm a man. That was the rim click of a dude who does pedicures. And you just wonder, I, I could just imagine. They're just sitting there and they're working because my feet ain't never, listen. You understand? Hey, I, I'm, not, I'm not giving these dogs out to people. You're the pet. You understand what I'm saying? Nobody's petting these dogs. I can just imagine sitting there and they, they're, they're talking in a language I, you don't understand. You're thinking, God, these are the nastiest feet I've ever seen. My God. This looks like sandpaper over here. Did they crust the toast? What's going on? I mean, I can just imagine those conversations. 
and, and it makes you feel insecure. It makes you feel uncomfortable because conversations are being had around you, but you're not in tune. And that's what the language of the Spirit does. Because there's more going on than just what you see in the natural realm. So the spirit language, the spirit of heaven, heaven's language comes in. And all of a sudden, it removes confusion. It removes insecurity. It removes helplessness. It removes that awkwardness. It removes that ignorance because to what's happening around us. But it doesn't remove dependency. We've just moved it from people to presence. And this is what the spirit of heaven exposes. It exposes heaven's agenda in the earth realm when we're praying in the spirit. Verse 15, so what's the conclusion then? Paul says, I will pray in the spirit and I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing in the spirit and I will also sing with my understanding. For those of you under the sound of my voice that thinks this is strange, I want to challenge you to go on a journey with Holy Spirit. Maybe under the sound of my voice, someone is rejected because you've been trained in certain denominational movements that praying in tongues is demonic. Well, I don't know how it can be scriptural and demonic at the same time. So I invite you, I challenge you to go on a journey with Holy Spirit. And in the areas where you may feel contention, don't listen to the preacher. Open up the book, spend time with the presence of the Lord in your personal encounter, and go on this journey with the Holy Spirit. Now, the language of heaven is so powerful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray in the Spirit. I will pray with my understanding. I'll sing in the Spirit. I'll sing with my understanding. One of the prayer team ladies well, it's Trey, Jessica Trey's wife. She came over to me and brought their beautiful little girl who, if I see them mishandle at all, I'm just going to take from them. <laughs> Jessica leans into my ear during, uh, uh, right there before church started. She goes, she started praying in tongues just like you. I'm like, well, of all the things I say, that's probably a good thing. For those of you that find it strange, watch this. There are 700 million Pentecostal charismatics on the planet today. You know what that means? There are 700 million people who believe in the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. Do you know what that means? In 1901, there was less than 1,000 people. And in 2024, there's 700 million people who believe in the power of praying in the Spirit and singing in the Spirit, building themselves up in their most holy faith. 700 million. Why, the reason I'm telling you this is because that means there are 700, people, 700 million people that are weird to you. If you think it's weird. Watch this. Ugh. Mandarin is the number one language on the earth. One billion people speak Mandarin. The number two language in the world is English. Uh, if the number one language in the world has one billion people and there are 700 million people that believe in the power of praying in the Spirit, watch this, that means that the language of heaven is the fourth most spoken language in the entire planet. Estimation, estimation that if this trend continues by 2024, the language of heaven will be the most spoken language in all of the earth. Can you imagine what will happen in this planet? You didn't hear what I said. Can you imagine what will happen in this planet when the most common language is not even of this earth? But people are saying, I'm praying, let heaven come down, that the spirit of heaven is being released into the earth realm. All of this manifest. And have a conversation with God. 
until God has a conversation with himself. I, I, I was about to button up my message and walk away. And the Holy Spirit dropped this in my heart for somebody in this room who you believe in it. You're not on some journey. You understand the power of the Holy Spirit and the manifestation of the language of heaven on earth. I want to challenge you in your private prayer life to pray every day in the Spirit. From now until Easter, every day you pray, pray until the Holy Spirit takes over that prayer. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Your most holy faith is going to be built. And you're going to walk in power that you didn't even know was possible. And you're going to watch confusion go away. And insecurity go away. And helplessness go away. And awkwardness go away. And ignorance go away. And fear go away. Because the Holy Spirit is coming and communing through you. For those of you in the room today, and this whole concept is foreign to you or new to you, I challenge you between now and Easter to just say, Holy Spirit, I'm open to you. Whatever you want to do, I, I was, oh, I know he's watching. I was talking to a minister, an evangelist in our network, and he called me after our youth conference a few weeks ago. And he called me this week, Thursday, I believe it was, Wednesday, maybe. He started talking to me about all of the abuse that he has gone through, his family running for their life. There, He's called to the Muslim nations. Through this ministry, Last year, over 500 churches have been planted in Muslim nations. Listen, listen, hang on, hang on, hang on. To God be the glory for that. But he's had to flee nations for his life and for his family's life. They have beaten him. They have scourged him. They have gone through all types of real persecution. And now this overwhelming sense of fear has set over top of him. And he's like, Pastor Glenn, I just... I'm scared. It's perplexing fear and anxiety. Sad acronym. Stress, anxiety, and depression. I said to him, I said, I called him by name, and I said, I want you to get into the presence of the Lord, and I want you to pray every day until the Holy Ghost takes over for you. And here's what he said to me. He said, but I don't have a prayer language. I said, called him by name. I said, you mean to tell me you've done all of this and you don't even have power yet? You don't even have power yet. I said, oh, this changes everything for me. Now I know how to pray. I'm going to ask the Spirit of God to overwhelm you right in one little moment. And here's what I said to him. I, I said, because he's analytical, okay? He's analytical. I said, why haven't you received your prayer language yet? He speaks like three or four different languages. I'm like, you can be like five language people. I'm bilingual. I speak country. And Holy Ghost. And he said, it's just because the Holy Spirit just hasn't given it to me yet. I said, oh, no, no, no. This is a gift. This is a gift. Your, your challenge, you called him by name, is your mind is unfruitful. Your, your mind is too fruitful. You, you want the Holy Spirit to come down and start making you talk. That's called possession. And Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He doesn't possess people. So I yield. All of a sudden, language, gibberish, 
that my mind can't comprehend becomes into my mind in atmospheres of worship. And I say, Holy Spirit, that must be you. So I speak them out. My, I yield my tongue to what the Spirit of God is saying. And then it begins to flow and to flow and to flow and to flow. And I, I said, oh, I called him by name. I'm trying not to name names. I said, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to begin to give you the language of heaven. Because if you can do all of this without being plugged in, Imagine how many Muslims are coming to Christ when you can step into the power supply. So today, I don't know what you're going to do with this message. Some of you may ball it up, throw it in the trash can. That's fine. But this is life's blood for somebody. And you've been filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And you've gone dry. Holy Spirit today has shown you He's put a spotlight That your holy faith your, your most holy faith is not being built Because you've allowed the language of heaven to cease Today I'm going to put you in a moment And I believe Holy Spirit is already here I don't have to ask them to come And I'm going to pray that God begins to fill you again Fresh and anew there are others of you that this is a completely thing and you, you've heard, you've got, you got issues. I'm going to put you in the presence of the Lord because this is not a Judah encounter. This is not a Glenn encounter. This is a personal encounter with the Lord and I'm going to put you in his presence and just, I just encourage you to be open to what Holy Spirit is wanting to avail to you today. Jump up with me all over this room. Dominic, Vince, come up here. For the next few minutes, as a matter of fact, I, we're, I don't know where my prayer team is, elders. I just, come on, just, just get out here in the front. We're just going to walk and pray for a few minutes. No, 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 I, we're not ministering. We're just going to, well, actually we are. We're going to minister to the Lord. We're not ministering to people today. They're going to create atmosphere, build atmosphere. Come on, school of ministry students. You're asking the Lord. I thought y'all were going to be in the 12 o'clock service. Praise the Lord, you're in this one. I'm asking the Spirit of God to speak to you today, to bring confirmation to what he's called you to the kingdom for for such a time as this, what the will of God is for your life in this season. I'm, Courtney, get out of your seat. Get, I want you to get into a posture of prayer. And maybe you're in this room today and you're far from God. Listen. This is about a personal encounter. And if you have sin issues in your life, lay them at the feet of Jesus. Because nothing else, nothing else matters and nothing else and no one else will do. Does anybody feel that way today? Come on, lift those hands all over this room. And for the next few minutes, I just want you to pray with your understanding. Lift your voice, pray in your understanding today. Somebody bless the name, bless the name, bless the name. 